Coming up, I join Gavin Shaw as we talk all things New York basketball, Knicks and Nets, breaking down why these two franchises are actually in somewhat similar waters right now as they prepare for a season with different levels of expectations, but all with the same prize in mind of adding a superstar at some point. Talk about the deficiencies, where they can succeed, and why the season series will be all eyes on for both fan bases coming up next. You are Locked On Nets, your daily Brooklyn Nets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, sir. It is the Locked On Nets podcast right here on the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team, the Brooklyn Nets, every single day. I am Adam Armour, flying solo for the moment, but momentarily we'll be joining Gavin Shaw and talking about Nets and Knicks, reminding you that we are, of course, free on all those great platforms. We appreciate you making us your first and of the day. And let you know that today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, official sportsbook of Locked On. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers can bet just $5 and get $200 in bonus bets guaranteed. Visit fanduel.com slash locked on to get started. And without further ado, we start the conversation on Locked On Knicks, Locked On Nets crossover. All right, guys, as promised, I'm not sure if this is the third, fourth, fifth year in a row we're doing it, but we're doing it again. Knicks, Nets, crossover, battle royale to start the season off. I'm joined by Adam Armbrecht, the fantastic co-host of the Locked On Nets podcast, my former stomping grounds. Adam, great to have you here. Great to talk. Knicks and Nets. How how you feeling, man? Lot, lots changed since uh, we, we did this a year ago. There were there were moments, man, when I thought there'd be a real glow track for the Brooklyn Nets fan base, especially with the New York Knicks. Unfortunately, uh, a couple of uh, superstars later. And a few more questions in the line for the Nets. And, and obviously the Knicks have put themselves in a good spot, man. I think both these teams are maybe in a somewhat quiet approach to the season for very different reasons, right? The two different tracks here, I think, for these franchises right now. All right. I, I want to talk about um, expectations to the Nets this year because I, I, I think they're – if for, for a team that basically is just running it back, I, I think they're sneakily one of the more interesting teams in the Eastern Conference, right? Because I, I think there's um, this idea out there, and I've seen it. Maybe it's just because I get a lot of a lot of Nets Twitter on on, on my Twitter, but um, that that the Nets could be really good this season, and I, and I could see that as well, right? Like on paper, they have the makings of an incredible defensive lineup. You have an efficient fulcrum in, in Mikhail Bridges, who after the trade put up 26 points per game on great shooting, basically um, everything you could want out of like a, a non like top 10 player in the league running your offense um, and, and a whole lot of depth at every single position. And also a younger group where similar to the Knicks, almost everyone in the rotation projects to be better this year than they were a year ago. So lots of reasons for optimism. Um, where I hesitate is after the trade, um, if I have this right, the Nets went just 12 and 15. I think the most surprising thing to me, unless I just got this number completely wrong, was that after the Bridges trade, they were only the 17th best defense in the NBA, which I, given their personnel, I, I thought they were going to be more like, oh, like top six, seven, eight. And, and that was how they were getting it done. So I say all that to say, Adam, what, what are reasonable expectations for Brooklyn? What, what do you think the best case scenario is? What's the worst case scenario is? And, and how would they kind of get to each of those spots? Yeah, and it's funny too. We talked about that defensive number that you're that you're referencing from last season after the trade, and I think ultimately it comes down to a problem that they're going to have going into this season when you think about expectations, and it's it's the backcourt play. Now, mystery one is Ben Simmons and his health. If you insert him in what is now being at least forward stated as a pure point guard role for him on the Brooklyn Nets going forward, they need that. They need that POA when we talk about looking on the defensive end. So if he comes in and he's healthy, then that's a really big problem. The other problem that you're going to have, and we talked about this last couple episodes, is the perimeter shooting. You go and look at guys like Spencer Dinwiddie, who was only productive from beyond the arc when playing with superstars like Luka in Dallas. Right? Um, Dorian Finney-Smith suffered the same thing coming over from Dallas as well. So there are holes offensively in this team game, and I think that's what the biggest question mark is. 37 and a half um, over under on their win total. Doug and I think it should be 39 and a half, maybe. I, I can see them going 41, you know, 500 ball, 42 and 40. And then Ben Simmons' play and production really does become a big factor, along with a guy like Cam Thomas. So 
there's, <laughs> I can paint a very exciting picture for this team in this season, but it's very rare that you list six question marks or six potential upsides and they all come to fruition. And that's, I think, the big difference contrasting with the Knicks, right? You guys kind of run pat here. You 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 lose out some options maybe through the draft, the offseason. But ultimately, the Knicks are a team that kind of have, at least from my perspective, a very clear floor of expectation to almost every one of their players on their roster this season. Yeah, I mean, you, you brought up the Vegas win-loss totals, and, and the Knicks is only – 44 and a half. And I remember when, when Alex and I first saw that we, we were kind of shocked. This is a team that won 47 games last year on, on paper seemed better, right? Because they played like a 57 yeah. win team after getting Josh Hart, they add Dante DiVincenzo for even more depth, lose Obi Toppin, which only becomes, I, I think a significant issue of Julius Randall misses time. And then, and then it goes from a non-issue to a, a really, really big one out of nowhere, but maybe that that's something we can, we can talk about later on. Um, I, I think I would be, I'd be surprised if this isn't somewhere between a 48 to 52, 53 win team. We were trying to kind of go through it outside of the possibility of Randall getting hurt. Where, where is this team going to have issues? And we, we just kind of came down to our, like maybe in the rest of the Eastern conference, getting a little bit better, maybe in an opponent shooting a bit better from three point range. But the, the biggest things were either Randall or Brunson taking a step back. And, and for us, I, I think we see Brunson going the other direction. We see guys like Quentin Grimes and Emmanuel quickly and RJ Barrett only being better this year. I, I think the Knicks have a chance to get off to a fantastic start to this season because there's so much continuity. And, and I'm kind of curious, like what, what would it take for Brooklyn to start really, really well? And I kind of come back to the thing you just mentioned, Ben Simmons, because if he's, and this is a, a immensely big, if, if he's the Ben Simmons of old, like you, you could see lineups like with, with him, Cam Johnson, Mikhail Bridges, Dorian Finney, Smith, Nick Claxton, where, where you just have like five, a borderline elite switchable defenders mm -hmm. on the floor. You have a, a fulcrum and bridges. Who's excellent. You have a guy in Claxton who looked like he was going to make an all-star case in, in the early portions of last year. You have a couple different guys who create their shot. You have enough spacing. Like that just seems like a really balanced group. And, and then with scoring like Dinwiddie and Thomas off the bench, like I see a world where the nets are more like a four five, six seed than a, a team that's going below 500 and scraping for the play. And it just that, who knows with Ben Simmons? Yeah, a big part. A big part of it is that, right? A big part of it is this player that represents, in theory, even if he's not all the way back to full strength of what he once was, but someone that can play with conviction, someone that can get downhill, attack at the basket, put pressure on defenses. And then we know he's an incredibly strong facilitator out of that point guard spot. And that's what the Nets need an orchestrator of the offensive side of the ball. And I think it really does apply for both teams in this instance, as far as where they shake out the Eastern Conference, because when you've about well, Milwaukee, okay, they are their team, but we know there's there's some building internal <laughs> potential issues here with Giannis. Boston, let's set them to the side. They add Porzingis. Brogdon may be a little upset, but he's going to be there. The 76ers and James Harden, the Cleveland Cavaliers and Donovan Mitchell. Like, all of these teams have something going on right now, and those are the top four seeds, maybe outside of Boston. The other three teams have something going on. Yes, if Miami gets Dame Lillard, that changes things. Chicago is this weird veteran run-it-back team, even though it was very unsuccessful a year ago. So that's where I think not only the Knicks especially into a higher level, but then the Nets, like, can they just quietly maintain a level of consistency and sneak their way into maybe, like you said, a cemented top six seed, safely avoid the playing game altogether? Like, those are reasonable goals. Just, and we said this time and time again, Spencer Dinwiddie, Cam Thomas, if he's going to step up, even Lonnie Walker, they're good additions, but these are not players playing on a team with superstars ahead of them. Mikhail Bridges may be on the edge of superstardom, but he's not a superstar. So all of their production, all of their consistency, that's what you have to kind of wait and see. And most of the numbers tell you they're not going to be as productive. They're not going to take that next big step forward with the caveat being Cam Thomas. If he gets into this station as a man, consistent role, well, then all bets are off because he can be a 20-point scorer for you, and that's what the Nets need, scoring production so that it isn't all on that starting unit, the Cam Thomas, uh, Cam Johnson's, excuse me, Kale Bridges of the world. All right, right back in on the conversation after we tell you about our title sponsor, and that is, of course, going to be our friends over at FanDuel Sportsbook because you can snap into the action this NFL season with FanDuel, the 
number one sports book in America. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus guaranteed when you place just a $5 bet. That's $200 in bonus bets, win or lose. And you can be going over there right now and thinking ahead a couple of days with the Detroit Lions at Green Bay. I've been bullish on the Green Bay Packers coming into this season. A little shaky last week, but they are going to be plus 102 on the money line. Take them. Don't look back. Give a little shake up to Detroit as they go for the NFC North cramp. But we know that when you get over there, the FanDuel Sportsbook app is going to be easy to use with a range of betting options that include spreads, player props, over-unders, and so much more. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and kick off the NFL season. FanDuel official partner of the F. Sorry, I was muted. All right, three, two, one. Yeah, I think that would be my fear if I was a Nets fan. What what can we manufacture e- either when, when Mikhail's out of the game or on nights where, where he just doesn't have it for whatever reason? And we saw kind of come playoff time, that was that was the issue um, in, in that first round series against the Sixers where Mikhail, who was incredibly efficient in the regular season, guy who shot 48% from the field, 38% from three, 88% from the line in the regular season, put up pretty much the same scoring numbers in the playoffs, but the two-point shooting went down to 43%. The three-point shooting ticked up a couple spots. The free throw shooting went down a little bit. Like, can he carry that role night after night after night? I, I think if I'm if I'm looking um, to this year, that that's kind of the biggest thing. Like, like, can he just do that on volume for 82 games? I mean, coming off an incredible summer for Team USA, what, what, what's your confidence in um, his, I, I guess, stardom is, is really the only way to phrase it and his ability to just drag this Nets team by um, by any means necessary in, into a guaranteed playoff spot? Yeah, listen, the only thing that we push back on when we talk about Mikhail Bridges is the idea of, well, he's been Iron Man. He plays every game. He played 83 games last year when you include coming over from the trade. He even snuck in an extra one, played for FIBA. But... An injury to Mikael Bridges, which has not been a concern, and knock on wood and everything else of value. But if that happens, well, then you can kiss the season goodbye. He has been was incredibly consistent coming over. He, unlike maybe Cameron Johnson, right, the one-to-one of, hey, you are now going from supporting role to dominant, on-ball, critical leader of the team. Boom. Mikael Bridges stepped into that with ease. He also showed in FIBA, by the way, which I think was really important, his all-around game where there were times, there were stretches when he was the number one option or the minimum when he should have been the number one option, especially going back to what was it, the uh, one that got them kicked out and ended up playing Canada. When they lost to Germany, it was like his numbers were there, but he only had seven, eight shots in the game. So he showed the ability to be a lead scorer. He showed the ability to be a lead facilitator. He showed to be a lockdown defender and to hit some clutch buckets as well. Obviously, that's the rim off the off the free throw miss into the corner, right? This elated moment that comes up short in the end. But all of those things tell you that this is a guy I think that we're going to be talking about as a 20 to 23 point score in the upper tier when it comes to production. The usage is going to be there for him. I have very little questions about him. I have very many questions about how they fill out the rest of this behind them. And that's, that's the contesting difference to me is the Knicks don't have that. They don't have this. Oh my God. I think what they have is if player X stepped up to an X level, well, now we could really be thinking about Eastern conference finals and making an appearance in the championship potentially. But at a minimum, I I just feels like the Knicks can go to the season and say, great, we'll see it. We'll see a top four seed. There's a, there's very little for me to think have concern around that, which should be a good thing for the Knicks, by the way, because This was the steady approach that I think they should have taken. When you had the chance to get Brunson, you went and you got him. But R.J. Barrett, I know I'm running long, he went through the ringer with the Knicks fan base from promising draft pick to this guy's a total bust. Now he's a poison pill contract. And then last year, it wasn't always perfect, but you all of a sudden went, oh, okay, maybe he's rounding into form. He's not a number one, but he can be a very, very good complimentary piece. And you saw how that got unlocked when you brought in a player like Brunson. Yeah, I... I Look, I I can't even it, because it's not even year to year. It really is month to month with RJ. Oh, he's he, gonna say, right? He, he gets off to these just disastrous <laughs> starts seemingly every single season, and there's no there's no real explanation for it. And, and there, there's a, there's a hope on, on our podcast, and I think throughout the Knicks fandom that um, his play in FIBA and the fact that he played FIBA is going to change that. Like he got got some of the misses out of the way. He he got himself into good shape. Had some real shining moments, including hitting that dagger um, against Team USA to ultimately. Mm-hmm put that game away. Um, so that was all exciting. His playoffs were really exciting because the process was, was just better 
than it's been at about any point of his career mm-hmm. where, where he was driving to draw two and pass the ball. And to me, that is kind of the single biggest factor that could elevate the Knicks offensively, not so much in the regular season where they were the third best offense in the league. Statistically, statistically, I have to emphasize that one of the top five offenses in NBA history. Um, and then in the playoffs, um, completely fell off offensively. I, I think we're out of the 16 playoff teams were something like the 14th best offense or so, maybe 15th best offense. Like they were not good on that end of the floor. And the issue was um, not having uh, really just having one guy in Jalen Brunson who could consistently break down a defense, a second guy in RJ Barrett who could do it a decent amount of the time and not enough guys who could make quick decisions, not enough shooting. And I think they solved that for the regular season to some extent by adding DiVincenzo in there. Mm-hmm. Um I have no concerns, again, offensively in the regular season. I don't really have a lot of concerns defensively in the regular season. I think the questions come playoff time. Like, do they have enough quick decision makers? Can they get enough shooting on the floor without sacrificing defense? And and that's where Quentin Grimes becomes such an essential piece for them. But so does RJ's ability to just not be a sinkhole shooting threes. And honestly, same with Josh Hart, who was incredible during the regular season. Um, from three and, and that was part of why the Knicks played like a 60 close to a 61 team when he was on the floor is because he was hitting 55 percent of like three three point attempts per game and then in the playoffs he was passing them up in the playoffs RJ Barrett shot a little bit better that was still like 31 percent on, on wide open shots so mm-hmm. if those two if honestly if either of them steps up as a three-point shooter and can hit th- just 36 to 37 percent of mostly wide open threes I think it completely transforms what the Knicks could be But if they have important stretches in do or die games where those two are on the court and not able to shoot it, that's a big issue. And it's why I I think it's almost essential, like come playoff time, Quinn Grimes is going to have to be the guy on the court for 36, 37 minutes a game. But we we mentioned Ben Simmons. We mentioned Cam Thomas. Is there is there anyone else you're looking for on the Nets and saying, like, man, this guy is is just a swing piece for them and and they really need him to step up? Or, Or is it really just those two guys? Uh, I mean, you can look at Cameron Johnson and just say everything coming over from Phoenix, it did not take that same one-to-one leap like Mikhail did. You go and you watch him play in FIBA. He starts out in the rotation and slowly just becomes a bench player. He was, He's a little forget, bit he older. starter day one in FIBA. For oh, by the way, we made a, we made a point about that. You know, we we we, yeah. we took it up on the podcast for that brief, you know, twenty four to thirty six hour period. We were hyping up that Cameron Johnson is starting in the FIBA yeah. lineup, and then it resorted back to what we thought it would be. Obviously, uh, when you get Anthony in there, um, excuse me, when you get Anthony Edwards in on that, but. So I, I think he becomes a big X factor because his usage is going to go up by default. He is the other offensive mover for this team. I, you know, I hate like not to go deep, but if you want to go deep on it, you can look at this roster and all the moves that the Nets made. I mean, listen, Dennis Smith Jr. is a non-shooting point guard, more traditional. He's going to set the table. I think that that's a nice, effective way to maybe help out the second unit offenses. He passes the basket really well. But by and large, it's like I go through and look at all of the players, whether you want to say Trendon Watford, whether you want to say a player, you know, you're not going to get Noah Clowney, by the way, this year. You probably will get some Jalen Wilson at some point on his two-way contract coming up for 50 games. Dariq Whitehead, the other young draft pick coming back from injury. So a lot of it to me is like Lonnie Walker as well, played with the Lakers. Okay, is that 36% from beyond the arc? Is that going to take a leap forward? Or is it going to end up looking like Spencer Dinwiddie, who's a 30% point shot, he doesn't play with Luka? So all of these things are what fall into a bag. When you say, what's the biggest X factor? It's reach in. Reach in and pull out a name that is not the top three or four players on this roster and then start to analyze what they've done historically and what they can be. Cam Thomas and his offensive game will be the unlocker for this team. I, I think bar none when we get into this year and then whether or not someone else claims a role in that front court, helping out with the rebounding, letting me Nicholas Claxton do a little bit more rim protection and not always having to switch. It's great that he can if he does that. It leaves you exposed in and around the basket as well. Let me just, I wanted to fire something quick here back at you. Um, when you look at this team, the Knicks right now, do you view them and say, it's good that we're kind of keeping our powder dry because that's the way we talk about the Nets, all this draft capital. Hey, Giannis is disgruntled, Luca in the distance, all these names, right? But when you heard Damian Lillard come up, were you like, well, shoot, maybe, maybe getting Jalen Brunson as good as he's been, do we wish we could have been available for this? Do we think that in another two seasons we're going to be talking about what became Julius Randle and whether or not R.J. Barrett still matters? Where is the confidence level that the Knicks have set the floor here and are ready to add maybe a key piece over the next season or two. 
Yeah, I think that's what I was trying to get at a little bit earlier with, with the 44 and a half wins. I because right. I I can't ha- help but have a little PTSD for the 21-22 season, right? Where we were having very similar conversations to what we're having right now. Like the Knicks were coming off um, a four seed. They were coming off a first round loss, but they added Kemba Walker and Evan Fournier, right? And, and you could talk yourself into, all right, wow, they're going to retain this defensive culture and this toughness that they built a year ago. But now they have like two of the better offensive guards in all of basketball. Oh my God, it's all mm-hmm. going to combine. They're going to have a top 10 defense, top 10 offense. They're going to win 50 games this year. They, they might make the Eastern Conference final. And then they, they sucked. They, they, they just sucked for most of that year. And I think it's a little bit different just because basically the same cast of characters is coming back. I, I just think Jalen Brunson is more reliable than the version of Julius Randle hmm. we saw that season. I think even Julius Randle, based on what he did last year, turning into a higher volume three-point shooter and getting most of his work done closer to the basket when he wasn't shooting threes, is more reliable than the two years ago. Julius Randle in terms of having one terrible season, one great season, one terrible season, one great season, which is what it's been so far with Julius Randle. So in terms of them setting a floor, I think there's a world where they're not as good as last year. I would be shocked if they were significantly worse than last year. I'd be shocked if they were even like mm. close to 500, like, like anything less than, which is why the number is surprisingly like anything less than 45 wins would be a real disappointment for New York. As far as not going in on Donovan Mitchell and Damian Lillard, I have no issue with it because I think what we saw from Jalen Brunson in the playoffs was a guy who, like, in the best case scenario, you could see finishing fifth in MVP voting this year, who could make a third or or maybe even second team All NBA, who who should certainly make an All Star team this year after the All Star break. What he was at like twenty eight five and five. Really efficient shooting last three games against the Miami Heat, basically do or die games with zero help against one of the better defenses in the modern NBA was putting up 37, five and five, right? Like he was, he was a, just a monster. Um, and I, I, I didn't really have any qualms about being out of it with Damian Lillard. Jalen Brunson is, is six years younger on a mm-hmm. substantially, like literally making, I think half as much money per year for some of the later years of the Lillard contract. So I think that's a great deal for the Knicks. If they're going to get a star, it's going to need to be a wing or a center, um, whether that's Joel Embiid, Giannis, whoever else you want to talk yourself into. I'm sure if Donovan Mitchell wants to come here, the Knicks are not going to say no to that, but that fit is still a little bit questionable. Um, But that is, I think, still the big discussion point because we say high floor for the Knicks. I I still question what the ceiling is. Like, I, I don't, I see a world where they make the Eastern Conference Finals. I really can't talk myself into them making the NBA Finals. And I think for them to hit that level, like they're going to have to get a greater level of star in the building to supplement Jalen Brunson, whether that's replacing RJ Barrett or replacing Julius Randle. Eventually, I think we kind of know who those two guys are for better or worse. But I'm curious from a Nets perspective, because when I was covering the team, it, it was this incredibly feel good story, right? Like, oh, look at these guys. They had they had nothing to do. They lost all their picks like it all sort of burned to the ground. And, and they found a way to get this fun, successful team full of young guys. And then the second they had a chance to get stars, like to be clear, every team in the NBA would, they said yes to Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving. And it was not the wrong decision because health permitting, they would have won a championship. I I would probably bet my life on that with James Harden, Kyrie Irving and Kevin Durant obviously now does not work out, but they get a whole lot of picks for their effort. Um, What's the appetite in Brooklyn to say, Hey, Let's do that all over again, because despite how it went and despite uh, my, my fellow Knicks faithful um, having a lot of jokes at, at your fans expense, Adam, um, I don't think the process was necessarily bad. Were mistakes made along the way? Sure. But the goal was right. Better luck. They win a championship, I would say. Um, is Brooklyn going to try to be in the star market? Like I, I know they kind of were on the periphery this summer, but maybe as soon as this trade deadline and certainly by next offseason. Yeah, and I think you're right. I mean, we talk about those moves, to your point. When you have the chance to make the moves for Kevin Durant, Kyrie Irving, James Hart, like you do them. You do them a thousand times out of a thousand. You look back at it now with everything that did not go right and say, I'd still do it because it puts you in a position to compete and win a championship. And without those types of players, like you don't have the chance to do it. You're talking about the Knicks. They've done a great job, but they're still that key player, that big superstar talent away. But you can't get to the superstar before you show the foundation. That's why I think they've done a nice job these last couple of seasons and bringing a guy like Brunson, who I I believe superstars look at as being a very attractive player to be helping to set the table for them, especially on the offensive end. But from a Nets perspective, yeah, you needed to go for it. You did it. That that was the goal. Make your franchise attractive for stars. You went for it. It didn't work out. 
Now, the way that I think things lucked out for them, or that at least Sean Marks regained some credibility, is he's known for being able to rebuild the roster. He's known for finding diamonds in the rough. He got Spencer Dinwiddie out of Detroit. He got Joe Harris out of Cleveland. He's done this time and time again. And the fact that a new owner came into Phoenix, and they said, we want a splash, and we want Kevin Durant, and there's, there's a blank check being written here. Getting Mikhail Bridges, getting Cameron Johnson, getting all that draft capital, I think it makes it palatable for the Nets. When we do our shows and we talk about some of these young flyers that the Nets have taken this offseason, it's easier to say, hey, over the next couple of years, we want to be competitive, we want to make the playoffs, and we want one or two of these six dart throws that we're taking to come through for us because that sets up the next era of basketball. And while superstars of the league, you cannot avoid the necessity of hitting on draft picks. Quentin Grimes is such a good example of this. We scouted him in 21. We loved him in 2021 as a piece that would have fit for the superstar team, let alone just his general skill set. And you're seeing in New York how he has come along and is he's going to be a phenomenal player for years. He can be a core guy for that franchise. You need those type of hits. The Brooklyn Nets right now are looking at Kim Tom saying, you were a first-round pick. Are you a hit for us, or are you just going to be a high-volume scorer on bad teams in the league? Dave Ron Sharp, you were a first-round pick for us. Are you are you capable of being a stalwart on the rebounding, uh, you know, on the boards offensively and defensively? Or are you about to get flushed out by a more athletic trend in Watford or a Darius Baisley? Like, these things matter. And I think for the Nets fan base – seeing a level of success this year making the playoffs then makes the process palatable if you end up in a 35 win team and you get dumpstered and you get swept by the Knicks in the season series that's going to change I think the way that you look at this team and the way that they look at players like Mikhail and Cameron but when you know that Giannis may want out you know that superstars are going to come on the market here the Nets have a lot of draft capital and I think they probably are one of the more flexible teams over the next two seasons in terms of movable pieces, money that's coming off the books, and then the ability to give a king's ransom to any team that offers up a star. Yeah, I, I, I mean, look, the, the Suns picks, like it, it's been much discussed in, on every single NBA podcast out there this offseason, just about the most valuable assets that any team is going to have to trade outside of a young star. And we've said it on our podcast, if, if Oklahoma City – wants to blow a team out of the water. I mean, even even the Rockets, maybe, depending on how some of the you know, like guys like Jalen Green have to step up and improve this year, but mm-hmm. they could blow a team out of the water. But if Giannis like, comes to the table and says, hey, I want to go to Miami, um, one of the L.A. teams or one of the New York teams, then like the Nets are, are all of a sudden in a smaller betting pool, and they can say to Milwaukee, mm-hmm. like, hey, you want that Suns pick who's getting you whoever the 20 20- 30 equivalent of Cooper flag is and, and Milwaukee's could be like, yeah, that sounds, that sounds pretty good to me. Um, so by there, the way, by the way, been... where were you guys on uh, like the Miami and the Dame Lillard, that, that conversation being a fringe team being Dame Lillard, but like, where were you guys on like the Tyler heroes of the world? Do you see the Knicks as, Hey, if, if there's three team deals getting made, maybe we actually end up being a fringe player. Cause that's the way we look at the Nets is maybe yeah. you get Tyler here as a byproduct or even a lesser player, but just improving as teams are like, well, we got to cast off money. You go, yeah, yes, please. I, I'm here. I can take on a player that probably has a reasonable role, even with your team. I, you know, it's fun. I, I, I love him for the Nets. First of all, I think he would be kind of everything. I mean, not to be clear, not the same player, but in terms of what you actually want to get out of Cam Thomas, Tyler Hero just just does that. Like, like there aren't mm-hmm. really any questions there. Like he he's going to provide that scoring. He'll provide a little bit more playmaking. Provide that shooting. Um, no no shots at Cam, but uh, will, willing to move the ball a little bit more, maybe. Um, and for the Knicks, I think this is, this is a very meta comment, but what's been kind of boring from a uh, Knicks podcasting perspective this summer is the Knicks just have good guys. Like you see Bleacher Report, like suggest, like, I think they did an article. It was like one big trade for every team. It's like, could the Knicks go get Bojan Bogdanovic? It's like, w- would New York be better if you put Bojan in for RJ Barrett? Probably, honestly, but there just isn't really like a clear deal that upgrades the Knicks because you want to see what Quentin Grimes can be like like he is like if you want to build a non-star backcourt mate for Jalen Brunson the idealized version of Quentin Grimes is basically that if you want to build a backup point guard for Jalen Brunson who can sometimes play with him Emmanuel quickly with what he does on both ends of the floor is basically that and the issue for the Knicks is they have this talent but ideally it would be allocated on the wing and instead, it's kind of concentrated at guard with Grimes, with DiVincenzo, with Quickly in particular, who's blocked by Jalen Brunson. And I think similar to what you're saying at the Nets, 
Um, at some point, there's going to have to be like just a way to combine Emmanuel quickly and RJ Barrett into an all-star wing. And I don't know right. how they're going to do that or what team that's going to be. And obviously that's not enough by itself for someone like Giannis, if he is indeed traded and doesn't leave as a free agent. But to me, that's the biggest question about the Knicks. Like how do you take this collection of, of really good, but maybe non-star players and turn them into two or three stars? Because the Knicks just have, they have nine guys who are above average NBA players, which is an incredibly good position to be in but just doesn't quite win you a championship. And I think the Nets are very similar where they're, where they're trying to push over the top despite not having that. And, and maybe the hope in Brooklyn is like it is in New York. Well, maybe Emmanuel quickly turns a corner. He's a star. Maybe Quentin Grimes turns a corner. He's a star. Maybe Julius Randle shows it for another season and in Brooklyn. It's maybe Camp Thomas puts up 24 points per game this year out of nowhere. Maybe Ben Simmons is back to all-star form. But I, I guess saying yeah. all that, Adam, to, to wrap this up here, what, what are your, what's your actual prediction for the Nets this year in terms of how many games they win, where they finish in the playoffs? And uh, we're, we're doing this with every host we have on for a little bit of spice. Uh, season series against the New York Knicks. What's your prediction? Yeah, I think uh, I said this when we set the over under 37 and a half. I thought that number was low. As of right now, I have the Nets 42 and 40. I have them being in the playoffs. I think some things will depend here on what happens when it comes to Miami and the Dame Lillard situation. But if I was looking at it right now, like I still feel like they get to the playoffs. It may end up coming as a play-in team, and they have to earn their way through that. But I would like their matchups in most of those scenarios. So we'll take them at 42 and 40. I'll take them to get into the playoffs. Probably still a first-round exit at this point. The Ben Simmons caveat is so large and looming over top of this team. And then season series, I mean, listen, the Knicks are a better team. Like, let's be clear, right? Um, I had to go look at the schedule. If they play them later in the year, then I think the Nets could win a couple of the games in this series. If they play them early, I actually think that's where the Knicks have a lot of success in general is all these other teams are figuring stuff out, Philadelphia and otherwise. Knicks just go, let's just start stacking some here, right? So if the Nets play them early, especially with a lot of these new pieces, I think the Nets could struggle. We looked at their first 10 to 15 games this year. They're going to have a hard time finding wins, even if they're playing at their peak. So I'll give the nod to the Knicks, unfortunately, in this season series and a, and a little bit of a grudge match maybe coming back next year. Yeah, yeah, I'll say I'll say Knicks 3-1 just because we, we owe you guys yeah. after kicking our butts so thoroughly uh, throughout the Kevin Durant era. So many so many good games that just ended and like in heartbreak <laughs> for the Knicks. But you know what? I don't want to think about that. Things are, things are good for the Knicks. Things aren't uh, given like you, you talk about like the circumstances that happened to the Nets last year, like crazy star player demands a trade, forces other star to to ask out who's a maybe top 12 player all time. Like you, you just say that as a headline. You're like, oh, that franchise, man, they're going to be in runes. The Nets are not in runes. They're not they're not right. in a bad position going forward. Could things be better? Sure. But there's a lot to look forward to in Brooklyn. There's we're a lot not to that to bad. Brooklyn. We're not that but bad. We're, That's looking market, in contrast you know? to Adam, like me, I think you're a Giants fan. Um, and just, yeah. and, and like, I, I look at it like that compared to the, I'm like, it could be worse. We could be the jets. And I, I, I look at just <laughs> like, I look at baseball too. Like the Knicks and Nets and the New York sports scene are not the laughing stocks. And, you know, given the last 20 That's years, right. that is, that is a fantastic bar for both sides to clear. Um, so for Adam Armbrecht, I'm Gavin Shaw. Adam, Adam, before I let you go, can you tell everyone, um, where, where they could find all your great work? Oh, at Locked On Nets on Twitter or X, whatever it's called now on YouTube as well. At Doug Nori for my co-host, at Adam Arrecht. Hey, man, we're covering the Nets, obviously heading towards the training camp, heading towards preseason. So for all the inner city uh, rivals, man, just look us up, enjoy it, and obviously support support our Locked On Knicks because we're, we're enemies on the court, but we're friends also. Of course, um, I always always get a uh, always have a great time doing these crossovers. Hopefully, we can do we can do a couple before each Knicks Nets game this year. Um, but until then, uh, we'll talk to you soon on Locked On Knicks and Locked On Nets. All right, right back.